out to the Odyssey Church, and uh, this is our second service. We were so pleased last week. We had so many people come and support us, but now it's time for us to start building our congregation. And as you can see, it's it, 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 we are a congregation filled with a whole bunch of teenagers because they are the future. And actually, we say they're the future, but this church is pretty much run by teenagers. <laughs> so we praise God for that. But we do thank you. We just want to know you. It, it doesn't matter where you're at. Whether you're a believer, whether you're an unbeliever, we're welcome here. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're addicted, whether you're recovering, whether you're a doer, we love everybody. God loves everybody. We love everybody. And we want you to come because we want to help people through the Holy Spirit, through God's power, to help people find and follow Jesus. So we thank you all for being here today, and I just appreciate you. I love you. I thank you for being here. And, and we had uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, we're going to attempt to do something again Thursday night that we attempted to do last Thursday night, which was to have a football game here. Uh, we ended up bringing your smartphones, because that's how we had to watch it last week. I thought that WBOC live stream, they don't. I thought the NFL live stream, they don't. And Bryce forgot the antenna, so we're trying to get an antenna this week and try to uh, actually watch it on instead of sitting here like this. But, but, if you don't come for any other reason, come and watch Teenagers Eat. We had pizzas and wings, and they devoured it. I think I should have bought more, because I only had like two pieces of last week. We so always buy enough that you can have enough for the week coming up, right? Not when there's teenagers involved. Okay, so if you don't come out for any other reason, don't like football, come and watch how to eat, because I love it. And uh, if you can't watch that, I, I think I, uh, I eat as much as they did. My daughter taught me a new saying, every pizza, no matter how big, is a personal pizza to the people who survive. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, we went through some food, and then Saturday night we have our small group, and we're really, what we're trying to do this week is, is important because we're, we're learning the template. We're learning how we can, as a group, start in the parking lot all the way to the altar call, how we can get people that don't know Jesus to become engaged so they find and follow Jesus so they can actually believe in Him. You know, we sometimes mess up, and I hear a little bit about that in the uh, service today. Uh, our first sermon series was called uh, Follow Me and See. We're a part two of that. If you weren't here last week, that's great because every lesson stands on its own. You're not going to be missing anything. But if you want to watch it, it is now available on the odysseychurch.com slash, uh, no, actually, Odyssey Church has a link to YouTube where you can find it on youtube.com slash the Odyssey Church. Hey, hey, brother, how are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, it'll be on the website soon. And it'll be on the website soon, too, so you can find it. We just thank you for coming, and uh, uh, it, it's been a great experience. With that being said, uh, if you were here last week, will you stand up? All right. Now, here's what I want you to do. Those that aren't here, those that are still sitting out, they are our guests today. They weren't here last week. Turn around and introduce yourself to them by name and ask their name. And I'm going to turn it back over to Bryce as we stand. Now, everybody stand and let's work on When you're not strong, and I'll be your friend, I'll help you carry on, for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody.
I came to Christ about, um, I'd say about a year and a half ago, and um, God is just amazing. What God means to me is just, I don't know, He's just great, and just His grace is just unbelievable, you know, and um, um, how basically I came to Christ was I had some friends and they invited me to church, and I realized, you know, I just started coming to church. There wasn't really a reason. I guess I had some friends there, they invited me, and I just came week after week after week after week. And then after that, I began to see a change in myself. I began to see a change in my attitude. I was more happy. Before, I was such an angry person. I was angry all the time. Walk around, look at you, like, don't even talk to me. You know what I mean? I was one of those kind of people. That was just so angry. My heart was just so hard. And it was just, and after time, I just began, God just softened that right up. And, you know, I just became such a happier person. And some of the things I was struggling with before that, you know, um, it was certain ways I would deal with my problems, you know, sometimes I would drink, I would do other things like that. And now God has shown me, like, the right way. Like, what I'm doing is wrong, and, and this is the right path. And I feel like, you know, I mess up a lot all the time, but God's grace every day. I'm given a new opportunity. He just cleans me up, you know. And just, I thank God for that. I just, he has done so much work in my life. Like, if you knew me before Christ, and now you knew me now, it's just, it's just totally different. And. Like, I don't know, it's crazy, you know. Yeah, and there's nobody else that can do that for you. There's nobody else. I thought I was going to be that way for the rest of my life. Always angry, just the way I was. You know, I was going through really bad depression and all that stuff. And, and as soon as I came to Christ over time, you know, there's, there's no other explanation for that. Nobody, nothing else can do that. And I just thank God for, you know, without him in my life, like, I wouldn't be standing here right now. I wouldn't even be alive. You know, I'm here for a reason, and now I know what I got to do, and just spread his word, and just help other people, and, you know, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Robert. We do, but I think in the scriptures, in Jeremiah, I think it is, it says God will take the hearts of stone and turn them into hearts of flesh. And, and Chelsea, you know, when you, if you really want to boil it down, what Jesus means to Chelsea is she loves him, he loves her. No, it's as simple as that. And what, what he did, he transformed her life. And, he, and, and so often, and again, it's part of today's message, is we think coming to church and accepting Christ is all about when we die and going to heaven. But it's not. She's living like it. She's living it more abundantly now. He took away these, these things that she was doing and changed her into a completely different person. That's why we do what we do. We believe in a big God. We believe in a God that can change the world and we believe he can use us in the Selbyville and the surrounding areas, not just to transform lives, but transform an entire community. We want to get so involved in this community that there's so many people that have their lives changed like Chelsea's had her life changed, that the community itself begins to change. And we believe our God's big enough to do that. Mm -hmm. That's why we do what we do. It's not about the money. That's not why we take an offering. In fact, I've agreed to go a year without a salary, and I don't say that for any other reason. It would be fair to ask you to sacrifice if we weren't willing to sacrifice. But more importantly than that, we need to do what we can do to make this a place so exciting, so great, that people that don't normally go to church will come to church. And that's why we buy pizzas and wings, hamburgers, hot dogs, and things like that on Thursday night, because it's easy to invite people to come and eat. You don't have to tell them it's church, they're coming to eat. They just have to be coming to church. They might hear a gospel message. And what happened? Our whole sermon series is Follow Me and See. Somebody loved Chelsea enough to say, follow me and see. And because they did, she followed, she became convinced that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was, not just a, 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 a man who came to earth, but God himself who came to earth because he loved her. And that's what we want to do. That's what we're after. So if I can have a couple of the others, we will go ahead and take our morning offering, and then we'll go from there tithes and offerings, Lord. And Lord, we just ask that you will bless them, that you will multiply them, that you will give us the wisdom to use them in a way that will glorify your name. Father, we just praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to do what you called us to do. And Lord, we just ask that we're obedient to your Holy Spirit, that we will be filled with the Spirit, that we'll be led by the Spirit, that we'll be guided by the Spirit to do your work here on earth. Father, we praise you and we thank you for your son, Jesus the Christ. 
in this beginning position would be almost impossible. They wouldn't see them for two years. Uh, phone calls were expensive. They, you know, they, they, phone calls would be rare, but they could email everybody. You know, you could email every day. They could get letters, and and that's what they would do. So everything starts out great. You know, they get an email every day, and about once a month they're getting a letter. But soon his wife starts to wonder. I wonder if my husband William is being faithful to me. I mean, after all, he's in France, the land of romance, and all these young French girls there, plus all the exchange students come over. So she gets up the nerve. And she, he emails him, she tells him his turn. Of course, he goes back and expresses his undying love to her. He would never do anything. You know, even out camp, maybe, yeah, I'm young, you know, there's a lot of stuff here out camp, but I would never, ever, ever do that. So about two weeks later, he gets back to me. He gets his harmonica in there. There's a letter there. He says, honey, every time you think of, you know, me, just to keep your mind off all those people in France, you would say, I sent you this harmonica. You didn't learn to play that. He sends her right back there. I promise you, honey, I'll think about you every night. I'll practice it every single night, and, and I'll just do nothing but keep my mind off of my plenty of harmonica you got. About two years later, you know, everything's up, and, and he comes back, and, and he gets off the plane, and there she is. She's waiting for him. Her whole family's there, and he runs up to give her a great big kiss, and she just puts her hand up. He says, wait a minute, Bob. We didn't kiss and hug him. Let me hear you play that harmonica. <laughs> She's a little skeptical. She's not sure he was practicing like he said he was. But I thought I'd say, you know, that's the way we are. She wasn't there to see him, and it was hard for her to believe what she couldn't see. And I think, you know, we're all like that, aren't we? We're all a little skeptical of the things we can't see. Yet, over and over in the Bible, it tells us to believe in the invisible God. It tells us to, to put our faith and trust over the over the visible and into the invisible. In fact, the good news is, Jesus tells us in his word, God tells us in his word, that we don't have to worry about seeing the invisible. God says, I have made it known through all creation that I am exactly who I said. Here's the thing. When Jesus came, he knew and he understood that we are a step we have a hard time believing in the things that we can't see, that we can't touch, and we can't feel. And the fact is, he still remembers that. But the Bible tells us to pursue the invisible over the visible. Now, if you remember from last week, uh, there was this man named Paul. And Paul is who we call the Apostle Paul today, but before he was the Apostle Paul, he was a man named Saul. And Saul did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was. In fact, he was so convinced that Jesus was not who he said he was that Paul went around trying to have the people who followed Jesus, what they called the way, later known as the Christians, he tried to have them arrested, tried to have them put on trial, be persecuted. In fact, uh, he even stood by as they were being executed. But Paul one day has this experience with the living God. He has an experience with Jesus and all of a sudden, Paul becomes a believer. In fact, he believes so much that he writes most of the books in the New Testament and eventually was persecuted for his faith. After he experienced Jesus, Paul believed that Jesus was exactly who he said. After he began to follow Jesus, he began to see that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. In fact, and, 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 and he writes this book, he writes this letter to the Christians in Romans uh, in Rome, what we call the Book of Romans, they in that he says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can surely see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. God tells us that we don't have any excuse for not knowing. Him. That if we look into creation, if we look up and see the stars and we look up and see the sky and the sun and the moon. If we see the flowers, if we see the trees, that God is calling out to us, that we can see Him through all of creation. That we can see His power. I mean, have you ever seen a, a, a tornado or a hurricane? We can know His divine nature. Yet a large portion of the world, a large portion of maybe even uh, people in this area, have a hard time believing what they can't see. They have a hard time believing in what they can't touch and feel. And Jesus understood that. He still understands that. And sometimes, and, I, and it is with me when I was young in my faith, sometimes we believe if we have questions, we simply don't have enough faith. But God wants us to know Him 
more than he wants us to understand him. And I know, and I know a lot of you in here know, that the more you love God, the more you begin to understand him. Now, with that being said, we're never going to know God fully until we meet him face to face. I believe that because we're trying to describe and understand an infinite God with a finite mind. And it's just an impossibility. I said last week that God isn't someone that we can explain. Jesus is not someone that you can explain. Jesus is somebody who has to be experienced. Sort of like trying to tell somebody what chocolate tastes like. You know? Until he takes chocolate, they don't know. It's sort of like explaining to somebody what love is. If you never experience love, you don't truly know what love is. Somebody can try to explain to you. Somebody can tell you how great it is. But until you experience love yourself, you're really never going to know what love is. It's the same way with Jesus. If you never experience Jesus, you can't truly know him. So I'm going to do the best that I can in my human power and hope God touches me and try to explain Jesus to you. But the fact is, all I can really do is whet your appetite so that you want to know him and experience him for yourself. Because when you know him and you experience him, things change. And it all starts with following and seeing who Jesus is. You know, I uh, want to make this statement, and it's going to be a statement that not everybody in here is going to agree with, and I know that. But it's one that I found true in my Christian life, and it's one that I found true in a lot of other people's Christian life. And that is, I think the church gets a lot of things wrong sometimes. We get the order of things wrong. And they have great intentions. I think there's great Christians that, that are truly saved, that are truly great people, but they get the order of things wrong. Now, I don't know, maybe you experienced this. I, it was really prominent in, 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 in the churches of, of the last uh, uh, 100 years where you would see the pastor, the pastor would give an altar call and he'd tell you to trust and obey, and they got trust and obey, but they get him, they say, come to this altar, lay down your sin, and you repent, and you follow Jesus. How many of you have seen that? You know, I think we've all experienced that and seen that. And all those things are true. I mean, Jesus tells us over and over again that we need to trust and obey him. Jesus tells us that we must repent and make him Lord over our life. I mean, it's real easy to make Jesus our Savior, what's hard is making him Lord. But, I think we get the order wrong sometimes. I mean, why would you trust and obey? Why would you repent in something you don't believe in? You get the order wrong. Look what Jesus did when he was gathering his inner quote. When he, when he started to gather his apostles, look how he went about it. He said, uh, when he saw Jesus, when he saw Andrew and Peter, they were fishing along the, the seashore, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, it records this. Jesus simply said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, come and follow me and be fishers of men. He said, come and follow me and make me fishers, or I will make you fishers of men. One time, Jesus sees this tax collector, tax collector sitting at his tax collector's group. Now, you have to know something about tax collectors in, in, in the Jewish times. They were hated. They, they were really worth it. The, the Roman government didn't like them. They tolerated them because they were Jewish. The Jewish people thought they were traitors because they were collecting money for the Roman governments and they were actually taking more money than they should. That's how they made got rich. So they were hated by everybody. In fact, they were so hated, Jesus set up his own category, put them in the same category as prostitutes. Now, he would talk to the religious leaders and he said, I'll tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. Not only will you not get into heaven, but those prostitutes and those tax collectors, the worst of the worst, will get in before you. He always used the tax collectors as an example of those. But look what he does. He sees Matthew at a tax collector's foot. He goes to talk to Matthew, and Matthew would have known this because Matthew was the one sitting at the, the tax collector's foot. So these were the words that Jesus said to him. As Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's foot. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. He didn't say, We can't believe. He didn't say, believe in me. He just said, follow me and see if I'm not the one that I claim to be. That's why we named this first sermon series that we did in the Odyssey Church, Follow Me and See, because that's what Jesus did. And if we're going to follow anybody's example, we want to follow the example of Jesus. He just said, mm -hmm. follow me and see. Spend time with me and see if I'm not the one that I claim to be. So there's one disciple that I'm going to focus on this morning, and uh, that is a disciple that's found in the Gospel of John, again, John was one of Jesus' followers. If you were here last week, we ended last week with a statement and a challenge. 
the statement was simply follow me and see the challenge was if you're not quite a believer, if you're not willing to the point where you can, you know, say I repent and believe, to at least come to church for the next four weeks. And during those four weeks, read a chapter of the Bible a day. Start in the Gospel of John and read a chapter a day. Now, we said start in the Gospel of John for a reason, because John does not leave anything to our imagination. John writes his Gospel, and he tells us right in his Gospel why he wrote it. And in the 20th chapter, 31st verse, he says, These are written that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, lead, by believing you may have life in his name. He doesn't leave it imagine. He tells us what his purpose statement is. He tells us why he's writing this letter, why he's writing this gospel. He said, I'm writing this so that I'll know who Jesus is, so that you might believe in him, so that by believing in him, you might be like Chelsea, and you can have life in his name. To know him, to trust him, to enjoy him. So my prayer is that if you're not quite sure that Jesus is exactly who he says he is, by following him, that you will get to know him, that you will get to trust him, and you will get to enjoy him. A message this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter uh, 1, verse 43 through verses 51. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. That's okay if you don't, because it's going to be on the screen. And I'm going to be reading from uh, the New Living Translation. And the reason I'm reading from that is I'm a pretty simple man and always understand things. So I'm reading from a simple translation so that I can understand what I read. And hopefully, maybe for some of you that don't have a lot of uh, uh, knowledge of the scriptures, that you can understand as well. So again, beginning in uh, the first chapter of John, and if you, you followed the instructions last week, you've already read this, so it'll just be a repeat for you. It says, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathaniel and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel, Did anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. As they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathaniel said. Jesus replied, I can see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathaniel explained, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus asked, Do you believe this just because I told you I see you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than this. You will see heaven open up and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway to heaven and earth. To read more of God's word, and I'm just going to pray that God, that you will touch this service, that, that Lord, that at the end of this service, people will see you, and that they won't see me, that you open their eyes and ears and hearts to your word, the word, who is Jesus Christ. And I thank you in the name of Christ. Amen. So again, this 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 starts out, this, this sort of segment of the scripture, this segment of John's letter, writes out by somebody asking somebody to come and see. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. I misspelled from, too, so just want you to know that. Well, it's perfect. You all be following me, not Jesus, right? <laughs> now, sometimes we read things a lot, a lot. I believe every word of Scripture is there for a reason. <laughs> Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. That's important because... Jesus started with just two people. There's only about 16, 17 of us here today. We're starting with more people than Christ did. John the Baptist, and many of you may not know who he was, but he was really the one that was foretelling, the one that was told to foretell Jesus, to tell him he was on the way. And one day, John the Baptist looks up, he sees Jesus, he says, there is the Lamb of God, the one who will take away the sins of the world. And John had this great big following. But two people, Andrew and Peter, heard what John had said, and they go to Jesus. And Jesus simply says, come and see. So Jesus starts his ministry out with just two people, come and see, and they transform the world. Maybe we can do the same thing in Soho, you know what I mean? Amen. And what did he do? Did he try to explain who he was? Did he try to tell who he was? And he said, no. He said, just come and see. Follow me and see. And that's exactly what Philip does. He doesn't try to explain things. He just says, Follow me and see. Now, now some of you, you may not know Jesus that well, but 
but this much you probably already know. Jesus is always asking people and seeking people, right? I mean, in the Gospel of Luke, we talked about Luke last week. He was a doctor. He was very methodical. He wrote his book in chronological order. He did the research. He, he, he studied the people that knew Jesus. He, he writes in his letter in the 15th chapter. He has three stories of people, of Jesus looking for things. Um, there's a man as a shepherd looking for a lost sheep. There's a woman looking for a lost coin. There's a father looking for a lost son. And Jesus sums up all these stories by saying that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, has come to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus is always seeking people, but he's especially seeking those that are lost. And today's no different. Now, I told you last week, I don't have some kind of hidden agenda. I'm not trying to try to do something here behind your back. I'm telling you right up front, my prayer has been, if you're not a believer in Jesus, you're not quite sure who he is, that over the course of the next couple of weeks as you follow him, as you read his word, that you'll begin to know him, that you'll begin to trust him, that you'll be able to do exactly what we heard about this morning, that you'll be able to enjoy life through him and enjoy it more abundantly. It's not just about going to a good place when we die. It's about living life now and living it to the fullest. And I don't know why you came this morning, but I know this much. Jesus Christ is seeking you. He says, follow me and see if I am who I claim to spend some time with me so that you'll believe in me. And says, Philip went to look for Nathaniel. Philip says, I believe who he says he is. I'm going to go find my friends and tell them. He says, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Now let me ask you. When Jesus found his friend, or when uh, Philip found his friend Nathaniel, did Nathaniel go, that's cool, man. Let's go, that's great. Let's go find the Messiah. Let's go see the Messiah. Let's go see the one you're talking about. No. He'd probably do the same thing that some of your friends would do. Are you crazy? I can't believe that. He was skeptical. He had some questions. He had some concerns, maybe like some of you. Definitely like some of your friends. Here's what the scripture says. It says, Nazareth, he's saying, how can anything good come from Nazareth? He's skeptical. He doesn't believe. He had this inner belief that kept him from believing Jesus was who he said he was. He had something inside of him that just couldn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was and who Nathaniel thought he was. And if you're not a Christian this morning, there is a reason that you're not a Christian. There's an obstacle. There's something that's keeping you from becoming a Christian. And no matter how I feel about that, and no matter how somebody else feels about that, it's what's keeping you from coming to Christ. And, you know, and, and as I think about it, here's some of the things I've heard. Maybe your obstacle is like a lot of other people's. How could God allow all the evil in this world? I mean, how could a loving God allow all the natural? Disasters. It seems like every time we, we open up the newspaper, every time we turn on the news, that there's something about a tsunami or an earthquake or a, a flood. How could a loving God allow that? How could a loving God allow so much evil in the world? I mean, we live in an evil world, don't we? We turn on the news, people killing each other, people shooting each other. How could a loving God show all this, 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 this evil and destruction? You know, maybe it's unexplainable. You know? How can a God be three in one? You know, for years we've tried to figure out how to explain that. You know, God is an egg. He has a shell. He has a white. He has a yellow. God is three in one oil. There's no way to explain it. We're trying to explain the unexplainable. We're trying to explain the infinite with the finite mind. Maybe that's your obstacle. Yeah. How can you believe a divergent birth? And I, I guess, and don't, you know, Pastor, I didn't even realize what an obstacle that was. I, that never bothered me. I had a lady come to me, I shoot pool one night, a lady comes to me, and we talked, she knew as a Christian, she goes, you know, I don't believe in Christ, he wasn't the virgin birth. I said, you believe God can create everything seen and unseen, breathe the heaven and earth? Yeah, we believe all that. And you can't believe he can do a virgin birth? He can greet the sun, the moon, and everything you see, but he can't create a virgin birth? Are you crazy? But to her, that was the obstacle. It was real to her. How could one man take away the sins of the world? There's just some questions you can't answer. You just can't get through that. There's so many denominations, so many doctrines. How do I know which one to believe? You know, for some people, it's the exclusivity of Christianity. Jesus said, I am the only way to heaven. I see. And for others, you know, here's a big one. I see how you Christians act. 
Y'all can't even get along with others, you bunch of hypocrites. I know a whole lot of people that are more loving than you, and they don't even confess a belief in Jesus Christ. How can I believe in a religion the way you act? I don't know what it is, but whatever it is for you, it's a valid reason. Maybe it's something else that's completely different. Everybody that's not a Christian has a reason they're not a Christian. They could be very good reasons. You know, I got a friend of mine. He's 52 years old. He's healthy as a horse. He runs about 100 miles every week, and I'm, you know, maybe a little bit of exaggeration, but at least 50 miles every week. He goes to the gym almost every day. He has a wonderful marriage. His wife, who's 45, expecting their first child. Most people his age are having grandchildren. They're getting their first child. I'm like, you know, dude, when you graduate, when your daughter or son graduates high school, you're going to be 80. <laughs> like, he's like, man, I'm loving life. I don't need Jesus. Me and God are okay. And he's got that pharisaical thinking, doesn't he? You know, God's blessing me. Me and him must be okay. And I'm not his judge. I don't know his heart. But what I know about Jesus, what I know about the scriptures, what I know about his lifestyle, I don't think him and God are okay. I think if he died today, he would die in sin. But you know, whatever it is that's keeping you from embracing Jesus, it would be foolish of me to ignore it. You know, maybe you have a different excuse. I don't know, and you can't ignore those things. I don't want another. But here's what I've observed. Here's what others have observed who've been walking with Christ for a while. That is, we never fully get our, answer, our questions answered. Do we? we fully never have all the answers to our excuses and our obstacles. Problem is, we have these treasures, but when we meet Jesus, it becomes personal. And, and what happens is, even though we may still have questions, those questions become smaller. Jesus becomes bigger. Questions don't necessarily get answered, they just don't matter as much anymore. Nathan, or Nathaniel, is very skeptical. He says, Philip, you and me have been friends for a long time. And I can imagine having this conversation with one of my friends, and I'm going up to him and say, This is man. I get this now, Jesus. I know we've been looking for him for 400 years. I found Jesus, and he's living in Roxanne. And they, they look at me and say, Roxanne, uh, nothing good comes out of Roxanne. Can't be Jesus. And besides, Bob, I know you. You're not that good of a person. You're telling me that all the religious leaders can't find Jesus, but you found him, and you found him in Roxanne. If that ain't happening, I don't believe you for one second. And that's sort of what Nathaniel did. He said, you know, I've known you. And I know what the law says. I know what Moses wrote. I know what the prophets foretold. I know all this is true. But you're telling me you found Jesus and you found him in Nazareth. And Nazareth ain't nothing good from Nazareth. Temple guards couldn't find him. The Romans couldn't find him. Even the high priest couldn't find him. But Philip, you found him in Nazareth? That ain't happening. That's just crazy. I believe if he came from somewhere else, but not Nazareth. Maybe that's you this morning. You know, you're sort of skeptical. This whole thing doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. You've got questions. You're not quite sure that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And that's okay. Because whatever it is that's kept you from embracing Jesus Christ, I would be foolish to ignore. Because it's important to you. Your concern and your your, your, your things that keep you from coming to Jesus, I can probably never fully answer. And here's the other thing I know. If, if you were to tell me whatever your obstacle was, and I, and I could sit you down and I could talk to you and I could overcome that obstacle for you, you'd probably come up with another excuse. You know, if, 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 if Philip came to Nathaniel and said, Nathaniel, okay, let me show you scripture, let me show you why Jesus had to come from Nazareth, and he did a great job explaining it, he'd just come up with another excuse. And if we look at his scripture, he doesn't even try to explain it, does he? What, what's he say? He says, come and see for yourself, though. Because I can't answer your questions. I'm not smart enough to answer your questions. Just follow and see. Just come and follow and see for yourself. And we know Philip did that, or know that they did that, because the next verse says, as they approached Jesus, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel. We see Nathaniel and Philip approaching Jesus. Jesus looks to Nathaniel and says, here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. I mean, Philip just simply says, I, I know none of this makes any sense to you, and I can't explain it, but will you just come with me and see? And Nathaniel does. And 
for some of you, have you really ever done that? I mean, have you have you ever taken the time to see who Jesus is, who He says He is? Ever taken the time to, to sort of come and see, study the Bible for yourself? Ever looked and dealt with the issues for yourself? Studied the facts for yourself? Because usually the people with the most questions are the people who haven't done the research. They just haven't sought the answers. They're waiting for somebody to give them an answer instead of looking for it themselves. And I think that's why Jesus spoke the parables. Because the people that wanted to know had to do a little bit of research. They had to do a little bit of thinking. They had to talk to God. And the people that didn't want to know, they just hear it and walk away. Follow me and see. He says, follow me and see that I am who I say am. And then when those people began to believe, they did exactly the same thing Jesus did. They began to ask other people to follow Jesus and see so that they could know him, so that they could be convinced. And they wouldn't try to explain it. they just say, listen, I can't answer your questions. But if you know Jesus like I know Jesus, then your questions aren't going to stop you. You may still have some questions, but they're not going to matter. Jesus will get better, bigger, but your questions will get smaller, and look what happens. Jesus, Nathaniel says, how do you know about me? And Jesus said, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathaniel explained, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Nathaniel has this personal encounter with Jesus. Jesus says, how do you know me? And all of a sudden, his questions began smaller. It's not important any longer, is it, that Jesus is from Nazareth. You have an encounter with the living God. You have a personal encounter with Jesus. It's not that your questions go away. It's just they don't seem as big anymore. Jesus becomes bigger than all your questions. Suddenly, Jesus isn't in a category. He's personal. He knows you by name. He sees what you do. It's not about getting all your questions answered. It's about following Jesus, and following Jesus is very personal. It's not that you ignore all your questions. It's just that when Jesus becomes personal, he becomes bigger than all your questions. So I'm going to address the, the men here first, especially you men that are married or have been married. I, I want to address you first. Because first of all, women are smarter than us. If you don't believe it, you just ask them, and they'll tell you that they're smarter than us. And men think differently than women do. And if you don't believe that, just ask them or try to win an argument with them. You'll lose every time. So this is just for the married and my ask is, do you remember when you were single? I mean, a lot of times we go through this process and we don't even realize that. You remember when you were single? I remember when I was single. I had all the reasons in the world why I would never get married. Man, I like my freedom. I don't want to be tied down. Why would I get involved with her when somebody better than her might come along and then I'm tied up with her? I don't even have enough money for the things I want. How am I going to have enough money for the things her and I want, you know? I know other couples. <laughs> I don't like how they act. I don't want to be part of that. I'd rather be lonely than stuff. I'd rather be single than miserable. Remember all those things that we used to tell people? You know, I had I was married one time before, and it didn't answer, but I'll never go through that again. We have all kinds of reasons we were going to stay single, didn't we? Now let me ask you a question. How many of those reasons did you work through before you got married? Or got married again? The answer is probably none. You may be exception as men, we don't usually go through the checklist. Alright, I like my freedom. She's alright. I'll be tied up her. Alright, I have made it rich now. I don't have to worry about the money. I can buy everything I want, everything she wants. Um if I gotta be committed to somebody, I might as well be committed to her. We didn't go through that checklist, did we? We never resolved any of those questions. We just met somebody. It was no longer a category. It was no longer about being married. It was about her. It was about someone. As long as marriage was a category, we had a reason why we weren't going to get married. But when we met somebody, and they loved us, and we loved them, marriage no longer was a category. It became personal. It became about her. And all our questions weren't answered. We didn't go through the checklist. In fact, some of those questions today we might still have, but she's bigger than all our questions. It doesn't matter as much anymore. You were in love with somebody. Somebody was in love with you. The obstacles you had didn't seem that important anymore. It's the same way with Jesus. Now I'll talk to you women. Why in the world would you ever have a baby? 
And if you had one, why would you have two? I mean, you ever thought about it? I mean, you know how dangerous having a baby is? Do you know what it does to your body? <laughs> Do you know how expensive it is to raise a child? Do you have that much money? Why would you have a baby? Why did you have a baby? Was it because you worked through all those obstacles? Or was it because it was your baby? Because it was your child. It was personal. You didn't think about those things. You were going to have a baby. Not about why you should have a baby. It became about your baby. That's how it all becomes Christians. They fall in love with Jesus. And it's no longer about all the questions. It's no longer about all the obstacles. It's about somebody who loves you and you love them. And it becomes personal. And when it's personal, questions may not go away. They just don't seem as important anymore. And I know this, the more you follow Jesus, the more some of your questions change. Because you've fallen in love with your Savior. It is personal. In our scripture this morning, we don't know for sure. It doesn't look like Nathaniel ever got his questions answered, do It doesn't look like he ever overcame those obstacles. He never overcame the fact that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of life. I am the way and the truth. I am the life. I am the ladder between heaven and earth. It's just those questions no longer seem to matter anymore. Jesus said, follow me and say that I am who I say am. I want you to know me more than I want you to know all the answers to your questions. Sooner or later, Jesus comes to us and he says, you know what? Following me isn't enough. I want you to follow me, but I love you too much to let you remain neutral. I ask all my disciples in the very beginning to follow me and see if I am who I claim to be. But after following for a while, I had to ask them to believe in me. Following is good, but sooner or later, I'm going to ask you to believe that I am who I claim to be. You know, here's what's going to happen if you decide to follow Jesus. Jesus asked Nathaniel, do you believe this just because I told you you had seen if you're under the fig tree, you will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth, you will see all of heaven open up and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. When you make Jesus personal, when you make him your Savior, you'll see heaven open up and you'll see Jesus who he is exactly who he says he is. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But one day he comes to you and says, you've got to make a decision. I can't love you way too much to let you remain Neutral. Jesus told the synagogue ruler in the Gospel of Mark chapter 5, don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus told the Jewish audience one day, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that God has sent. His disciples, his apostles, he said, follow me and see and believe in me. And then he comes to them and he tells them the same thing he tells us, come see and believe. Coming to see is nice, but sooner or later you've got to make a decision. Thomas, one of his inner twelve, one of the twelve apostles, he says, stop doubting and believe. To Philip, he said, believe me when I say that I am the Father, or the Father is in me and I am in the Father. To Peter, he asked the same question he asked each one of us. Who do you say that I am? And when you look at it that way, it's not a category. It's not about Christianity. He says, who do you say that I am? It's personal. It's a personal question which requires a personal answer. In other words, he's saying, do you believe I am who I claim to be? Peter, do you believe in me? It's the same commands he gives us today. Follow me and see. Believe in me. Follow me and see. Believe in me. Follow me and see that I am the one that I came to be, and then believe in me. If you follow Jesus Christ, it will become personal. And you might not have all your questions answered. I don't have all my questions answered. But I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, whom I love and who loves me. And through him, I began.
Here's what I want you to do this week. If you're like Philip and you already believe that God is who he says he is, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Redeemer, that he is the Anointed One, that he is the one who came to give life, the one that came so you could live life and live it more abundantly, do what Philip did. Invite somebody to come back to church next week. That's how we build not the Odyssey Church, but the church, the body of Christ. Invite people to come and see. Invite them for a Thursday night to have pizza and wings if you're not comfortable right now on Thursday night. I'll invite them to come on Sunday morning. And if you have to buy them, I'm okay with that. Tell them that you'll buy them lunch. I mean, it's a small price to pay for somebody's eternal salvation. Tell them that, hey, listen, it's a new church. There's not a lot of people there yet. And I'm not comfortable going myself. Come and see with me, will you? Small price to pay for somebody's eternal salvation. But maybe you're still like Nathaniel. You're still skeptical. And if that's you, follow Jesus and see. Just come back to church for the next three weeks. That's not a lot of time. Hour and a half, maybe. Hour and 15 minutes of your time each week for the next three weeks. Read one chapter of the Bible, then start in the Gospel of John. Why do we start in the Gospel of John? Because John tells us exactly why he wrote his scripture. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John wrote his Gospel, so we know Jesus, so that we would trust Jesus, so that we could have life in his name. And then just let God lead you from there. My prayer is that after you're done reading the Gospel of John, that you're going to know him better, you're going to trust Him more, and you're going to live life through Him and live it more abundantly. Follow and see that Jesus is who He claimed to be, claimed He was. Not so you'll have all your questions answered, because I'm telling you, I've been following Christ for over 20 years now, and I don't have all my questions answered yet. But your answers, your questions will just become smaller, and He'll become bigger. Jesus will become personal. He'll be your Lord and your personal Savior. And when He becomes personal, He becomes bigger than any of your questions. If you've seen and you believe, you know, we asked you this morning, we've got prayer warriors here, pray with us this morning. Jesus said, believe in me and you will see the glory of God. If you now believe and you want somebody to pray with, there's a prayer room that you walk out right to the, the right, I'll be there, come talk to me. Maybe you're a Christian, you've begun to have your doubts, that, that you will walk with Christ one day and some things have happened in your life and you're just not sure that Jesus is who he says he is anymore. Come sit with me. Come talk to me. Follow and see. Come back for the next three weeks. Just, just let us finish out this series and, and see if Jesus isn't who he says he is. That he is your personal Lord. Your personal Savior. Make it personal. Follow Jesus and see. The practical application of today's message is simply, if you're a believer, to invite people to come and see him. If you're not quite sure Jesus is who he says he is, I'm not going to ask you to quit doing all the things wrong yet? Why would you quit if you don't know? Just ask me to follow and see. Read your Bibles and come back for the next three weeks to see if Jesus isn't who you claim to be. Believe in Jesus so you can see the glory of God in this world and the next world. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to speak your word. Father, I praise you and thank you and ask that today that hearts were open, that eyes and ears were open, not to hear a message from me, but to hear a message from you. Father, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would begin to stir hearts, that they would read the scriptures, and they would begin to burn with him, Father. Father, we ask, Lord, through your power, that we can believe as we follow and see. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen.